This topic is so huge that I've had to put it into three videos. This first part is an introduction to what climate change is and about some of the gases that we put into the atmosphere and how we could adapt our way of life to produce less global warming gases. As I write this, the UK is having a mini heatwave with temperatures reaching 38 degrees Celsius in some places and in Europe some places reached 42 degrees Celsius. The 4th of July saw Anchorage, Alaska, record a temperature of 32.3 degrees Celsius. Their records for the month of June show an average temperature 14 degrees Celsius higher than normal. Satellite images reveal fires across Greenland, Siberia and Alaska. The eastern and central US have also had a heat wave with temperatures reaching 38 degrees Celsius. And in November last year, northern Australia saw temperatures soar to 42.6 degrees Celsius, killing, by heat exhaustion, 23,000 spectacled flying foxes. So what is causing all these events? Well, put simply, climate change. It is happening now and it is because of us. So what is climate change? Climate change is defined as the long-term alteration of temperature and normal weather patterns in a place. This could refer to a particular location or the planet as a whole. So climate change does not just mean that our planet is warming. There is also a change in the weather patterns. These include an overall increase in global precipitation, Projections suggest a reduction in rainfall in the subtropics and an increase in subpolar and some equatorial regions. The near-term projections, that is from 2016 to 2035, is that there will be more frequent hot days and possibly more intense droughts and tropical cyclones. Long-term projections from 2081 to 21,000 are that there will be more very hot days and fewer very cold days. The frequency, length and intensity of heat waves will very likely increase over most land areas. Already, extremely hot nights have doubled in frequency and the area in which extremely hot summers are observed has increased 50 to 100 fold. Also, dry regions may be affected by an increase in the risk of drought. Over most of the mid-latitude land masses and wet tropical regions, extreme precipitation events will very likely become more intense and frequent. This climate change is brought about by global warming, which is the increase in the planet's overall temperature due to the burning of fossil fuels such as natural gas, oil and coal, which releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Other greenhouse gases such as methane and nitrous oxide also collect in the atmosphere and absorb sunlight and solar radiation that have bounced off the Earth's surface. Normally this radiation would escape into space, but the gases trap the heat and cause the planet to get hotter. Scientists at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies have studied global warming and believe that the average global temperature on Earth has increased by about 0.8 degrees Celsius since 1880. Two thirds of the warming has occurred since 1975 at a rate of roughly 0.15 to 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade. In 1988, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, was set up by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment to provide an objective source of scientific information. In October 2018, the IPCC released a report showing that many of the adverse effects on our planet will occur at 1.5 degrees Celsius and not at the 2 degrees Celsius as previously thought. It also highlights the difference in the effects of an increase in temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to 2 degrees Celsius. The effects are still devastating but some can be avoided. Such as by 2100, global sea level rise would be 10 centimetres lower with global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to that of two. The likelihood of an Arctic Ocean free of sea ice in summer would be once per century with global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius compared with at least once per decade with two. And coral reefs would decline by 70 to 90% with global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, whereas more than 99% would be lost with a warming of 2 degrees Celsius. To keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, anthropogenic, that is human-caused carbon dioxide emissions, will need to fall from 2010 levels by 45% by the year 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. This means a huge shift in how we go about our day-to-day -day lives and also needs policies put in place by governments, but it could and must be done. Many of you will have heard of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. This is a legally binding global action plan 
to avoid dangerous climate change by limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius and pursuing efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The Paris Agreement opened for signature on the 22nd of April 2016 at the UN headquarters in New York. It entered into force on the 4th of November 2016. It was ratified by 55 countries, which accounted for at least 55% of global emissions. Since then, more countries have ratified, and the total at the moment is 185 countries. The Paris Agreement asks all signatories to meet nationally determined contributions and for them to report regularly on their emissions and on their implementation efforts. There will also be a global stock take every five years to assess the collective progress towards achieving the purpose of the agreement and to inform further individual actions by parties. Although there are great political issues with the Paris Agreement, it is a great step forward and some governments are working very hard to fulfil their pledges. So what do we do as a human race to bring about such a change in global temperatures? Well, the most obvious way in which we contribute to climate change is by burning fossil fuels. The burning of fossil fuels, like coal, oil and gas, releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. 87% of anthropogenic carbon dioxide comes from burning fossil fuels. Humans have increased atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration by more than a third since the Industrial Revolution began. There are many ways in which to reduce your carbon footprint, and so I am going to just mention some of the easy ones that you can try and do, or ask your parents to do. One of them is to eat local food. This reduces the distance that food has to travel and so reduces fuel use. Use your cars less. Try to use public transport or walk or cycle when you can. Reduce or eliminate your meat and dairy consumption. Processing meat consumes a lot of fossil fuel and studies have shown that a vegetarian diet produces half as much carbon dioxide and a vegan diet reduces carbon emissions sevenfold as compared to diets that include meat and dairy. Try to buy foodstuffs in bulk when possible and use your own reusable container. Reduce or eliminate your consumption of bottled water. Bottled water has often travelled long distances before you drink it and tap water is perfectly safe to drink so buy a reusable water bottle and use that. This will also reduce the use of single-use plastics. Turn down your heating and make sure that your home is properly insulated. When washing laundry or dishes, use cold water wherever possible. This will eliminate wasting energy on heating the water. Keep the use of a tumble dryer to a minimum. Try to air dry instead. You can install a low-flow shower head to reduce hot water use and taking shorter showers helps too. As your incandescent bulbs stop working, replace them with LED light bulbs, which will last longer and use less energy. You can unplug your appliances and electronics when not in use, as many devices continue to use energy. You could plug them into a power strip so there is only one switch to turn off. When nobody is in the room, turn all the lights off. Have the last person out of the room turn the television off after watching it. Another source of anthropogenic carbon dioxide is deforestation. This is a topic I want to cover in depth in another video, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Trees, like any plant, make their own food by the process of photosynthesis. This is when carbon dioxide is taken in by the plant and is turned into glucose. When trees are cut down, they are either burnt or left to rot. Both processes release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. There is also the problem that the trees are no longer there to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in the first place. It is estimated that deforestation accounts for 10% of global warming emissions. Another human activity that adds carbon dioxide to the atmosphere is the industrial processes of cement manufacturing, which accounts for 4%. To produce cement, limestone, which is calcium carbonate, is heated to a high temperature, and this process releases carbon dioxide. And the burning of fossil fuels to heat the kiln also results in carbon dioxide emissions. It is possible to use some other materials besides limestone, but this has its own hazards in releasing toxic chemicals. Alternatives to using fossil fuels for the heating process can also be used in order to reduce carbon emissions. Water vapour is another gas which contributes to climate change and probably accounts for about 60% of the warming effect. It is in fact the world's most abundant greenhouse gas. Warm air can hold more water vapour than cold air, so as air temperature increases, more water vapour is absorbed into the atmosphere, making the air more humid, and as water vapour is a greenhouse gas, this makes the air warmer, and so on. There is a positive feedback effect. 
There is the possibility that adding more water vapour to the atmosphere could produce a negative feedback effect. This is because more water vapour leads to more cloud formation and clouds reflect sunlight, reducing the amount of energy that reaches the Earth's surface. However, more cloud cover also means more condensed water, which increases the temperature. Needless to say, the effects of water vapour on climate change is an active area of research. Another global warming gas I want to mention is the halocarbons. A few halocarbons are produced by microorganisms, but most are synthetic compounds made by man and are made up of one or more carbon atoms linked with one or more halogens, such as chlorine, fluorine or bromine. They are used in refrigeration, air conditioning and fire extinguisher systems. Although the concentration of them in the atmosphere is relatively low, they can remain in the atmosphere for up to 400 years and their warming effect ranges from 3,000 to 13,000 times that of carbon dioxide. The best known type of halocarbons are CFCs. These were found to destroy the ozone hole and in 1987 many world nations agreed to control their use and signed the Montreal Protocol on substances which damaged the ozone layer. CFCs were substituted by HCFCs and HFCs which are less damaging to the ozone layer but still trap heat in the atmosphere. HCFCs are mainly used in refrigeration and air conditioning equipment and since 2001 the use of HCFCs in new equipment was banned. From the 1st of January 2015 the use of recycled and reclaimed HCFCs to top up or service existing equipment is also banned. HCFCs are being phased out of use and completely banned by 2030. Limitations on the use of HFCs came into force at the beginning of this year, starting with developed countries, and by 2024, developing countries are expected to also start limiting their use. There is still methane gas to discuss, but I will continue with this in part two, due to arrive in two weeks' time, as well as the effects of climate change on coral reefs.